Welcome to another episode of Power Move Makers. This series was created with a simple goal in mind, to bring to the table high-level executives, successful entrepreneurs, and just all around inspiring human beings. Not just focusing on their successes, but more important, shining a spotlight on the journey they had to travel to get there. And this week's guest, with an S, this is a first for me, interviewing two people at the same time, but I am so looking forward to this, industry, to this interview because they come from a predominantly male-dominated industry. And as I was looking into their stories and learning more about them, I was like, I have to have them on the show because they come from the trucking industry. And when you think trucking, more times than not, you associate that with males but I have two females on this week's show who are just dominating and excelling and showing that they can do it just as good, if not better, than the men. Please welcome to this week's show, Miss Tristan Simmons and Samantha Norman. Welcome, guys. Thank you so much for having us, Sean. Thank you for yes, your time. Thank you. Okay, let's get into this. You know, I, I, I do these interviews and I try to have deep dive conversations with experts in their particular industries so that if somebody else out there is looking to get into this field, I can knock out a lot of the questions and get it straight from the horse's mouth. So I'm going to be firing questions at you guys. So please feel free to elaborate as best as possible and think about yourselves maybe 10 years ago when you were learning or just wanted to understand this industry. Um, that said, how did you guys, and I'll start with you, Sam, how did you even get into this business? Great question. So my husband used to have um, a partner in a trucking company before we met. Um, after we had got married, um, the guy that he was partners with actually wanted to get into more home renovation. So my husband was like, you know, would you want to start our own trucking company? Um, they actually went into our cul-de-sac and flipped a coin on how much we were going to buy the truck from him. Um, so we ended up buying the, we ended up buying our first truck. Um, so that's how we actually got into the industry. But the guy that we did, that he was partner with actually ran a lot of the back office. So when we took over the trucking company and then fell on all us, or, you know, fell on us. Um, so that's how we got into the trucking industry. Um, and now we have five trucks and we do a lot of refrigerated trailers. So a lot of like temperature controlled, um, products. Okay. Before I go to you, Tristan, Sam, it was your husband, was he a driver? He was in the- He actually drives too. Okay. Mm -hmm. So he currently is still driving. When he wants to. <laughs> he does have his CDL though. He, he, he does drive when he wants to, but um, I mean, he has a 2019 Bobo that just sits, I mean, when he, you know, when like insurance or something is due and we have to put down a big down payment, he will go out and, uh, you know, turn a couple of loads and bring us some extra income. Okay, gotcha. So his partner wants out. Partner says, look, you know, if you want to buy this truck, I'll sell it to you. And that was, you guys have a conversation and that was your way into this business. Do I have that straight? Yes. Yep. Okay. Kristen, how about you? So I, got, I like to say I got into trucking by default. Um, my husband, we were having a conversation one day with his dad. His dad has been in the trucking industry now for about 45 years as a driver. At the time, this was back in 2009, he would come from off the road after being gone for like weeks at a time. And let's just say his money wasn't right. So we were confused. Like he's like the hardest worker that I know always on the road. So I'm like, like what's really going on? So we started having a conversation and I asked him, I'm like, so how, you know, like, do you know how to start a trucking company? Like how much does it cost to start a trucking company? So he was like, all we need is a truck and a driver like me, we can make a lot of money. So we literally started with a, a used Freightliner. Our very first truck, a used Freightliner. I said, 
if I have some money in the bank, enough money to buy a truck, would you drive it? And he was like, absolutely, I would. So we found a truck and we put him in a truck. And that's the beginning of our story. I never had any intentions on getting into the trucking industry. It was just a matter of really wanting to help a family member. I mean, he was family and I know he was a really hard worker and he really wasn't being um, paid well for all the work that he was doing. And I'm like, let's let's jump in and let's change that. So it was simple as that. Your father-in-law was the hardest man, hardest working man that you know, but his paper just wasn't right. And you it's sought to help right. him and in helping him, it led you into this new industry. Absolutely. His his paper did not match his work ethic. And, and we had to fix that very quickly. Understood. Okay, so you both operate as freight brokers, correct? That's correct. Explain to me, and either one of you can take this question. Explain to me and my audience, what is a freight broker? Oh, I can do it. So basically, a freight broker is a middleman. So we um, are, we go to a shipper who becomes our customer, and they give us loads, and then we literally just give it to the carrier for them to haul it, and we make a percentage off of that transaction. We don't handle the freight. We don't drive the trucks. We don't have to have equipment. We're just the middleman. So a freight broker is literally the in-between guy. That's correct. We, and in, we your case, that's it. in your case, girl, women. Women. <laughs> yeah. Right. We, we get out in the field and we go find customers that have freight that needs to be moved and we we have to get them to trust us. So our main job is being a problem solver and building a relationship with, with customers and carriers. You know, customers are the actual shippers, but the carriers as well. So we have to get out there Absolutely. and find the people that have the freight that needs to be moved. And then we turn around and we find trucks to get that done. And like Sam said, we never actually touch the freight. In our case, it's a little different because we are able to broker freight to our own trucks. I as well have five trucks. So when we started back in 2009, we had that one truck and at first we made a lot of money, but then we failed miserably. I mean, we, we went through everything that you can imagine. And on, that's really get, a part of the story. Before we get to that part of the interview, cause I'm going to go there. I want to know the mistakes. Okay. I want to know the different things to look out for. I'm just okay. the backstory now, if, if you don't mind. No problem. Okay. Freight broker. I get it. Freight agent. What's the difference between a freight agent and a broker? So the agent actually works under the broker's authority. An agent can actually have their own business, their own entity, and in, in the freight world, we call it their own book of business, but they don't have all the financial and legal responsibilities as a broker. So if you said, if you called me up, Sean, and you said, hey, I'm thinking I want to be a freight agent and work under you because I have some customers, some friends I already know that's in, you know, shippers and they have things that need to be moved, you can work under my brokerage without going out and getting your own authority, your own insurance, your own surety bond. And you're literally you're literally just responsible for getting that freight covered. We do the same thing. Brokers and agents do the same thing, but the broker holds that legal and financial responsibility. Understood. Very similar to like a real estate agent and a real estate broker. Great analogy. Great analogy. Can an agent work for multiple brokers at the same time or are they exclusive to one broker? That's a great question. And I'm going to be perfectly honest question. and transparent. I personally have worked for two brokers at one time. I do not recommend that. It, it, gets, it, it can get confusing um, and it could be very different reasons why. I literally worked that way because I had a friend that um, owns a brokerage and I partnered with them on a very large account. So I worked under his brokerage as a freight agent while I was working for another broker. They both knew I was very upfront because um, it was a customer that I was going after for a while in, in the government sector. So um, I, I told them both what I was doing but I don't really see a need to do that unless you have a special circumstance. 
So the answer is yes. It's not illegal, but you know, I, I don't suggest that anyone do that. Sam, if you want to add. And I was going to say, it's probably, it's probably the preference of the actual freight broker, too, that they're working up under. They may only have them, you know, do like a non-compete clause. But like she said, I mean, it's definitely not illegal. I mean, you just sign a contract with multiple freight brokers. They just want to make sure that there's, you know, like I said, a clause in there that they can't work with another freight broker. Because if they fall out, they can take all them customers and just move it to another. Is it one of those unwritten rules in the industry that it's frowned upon? I know legally they can do it but is it is it one of those things that if i come to you guys as an agent and i say look i'm also working with you know another broker would you sean go ahead just stick with that person when you're ready to be exclusive to us come to us or is it, is it frowned upon or is it commonplace in the industry because we get so busy, I honestly don't see or hear of a lot of people working as an agent under multiple brokers. Like, for my situation, I think it was just very unique because, I mean, I'll just tell the customer, AFES, I don't know if you're familiar, but AFES is the Army and Air Force Exchange, which is located on military bases. And I wanted that customer for a long time, and it was hard to get that customer. My friend's brokerage had the credentials that I didn't have at the time or even the company that I was working with at the time to, to get that customer. So I was very transparent that, you know, I had been making those calls. I had been making the connection. And basically he had a place for me to come and move that freight and we could both benefit. So I'm not going to say that it's so much frowned upon, but I, I would think just like Sam said, as the broker, you know, you need to be very clear on what it is, you know, how your business runs and what you expect, you know, you would have them sign that non-compete clause, you know, I mean, there's so many ways to do it. It's your business. Like you can do it the way you want, as long as you're following the rules of the FMCSA. So I personally don't hear of a lot of agents just working for multiple brokers. Um, I, to this day, I still benefit from that customer under my friend's brokerage, even though I have my own. So it's just a business relationship that we build and we have a, a mutual understanding and we both benefit from that customer. So again, I don't, it may, it could be frowned upon, you know, because you may think as a broker, this agent um, may take some of our company's information to another broker. So I, I highly, I just don't recommend it unless, like I said, you have a very certain um, special situation that, you know, would, would allow you to do that. Got you. Sam, question for you. Again, this is your world. It's not my world. So I'm going to ask very basic questions because I don't know who's going to be listening to this on podcast form or watching this in video mm -hmm. form. You guys are using terms, uh, carrier, shipper. Yep. Can you explain in very dumbed down ABC terms who is a carrier and who is a shipper? Sure. So your carrier is your trucking company. Those are the ones who actually owns the truck. So, um, you know, like you probably heard of like J.B. Hunt, just anybody that's on the freeway, anybody that has to deliver to an actual shipper. Your shipper is your customer who has the warehouse, who holds the products in that warehouse that has to be moved. So that could be Walmart, that can be Kroger, Target. Um, that's why we tell people it's so easy to find shippers, because anybody that has freight to move is a shipper. Gotcha. Great answer. What is needed to become a, a, a broker? Is this something, if I, if I said today, I want to become a broker, do I have to go to four years of college? Is there a six-month certificate program? What is needed on my side to become a licensed broker? And I guess, Sam, you can answer that question um, yourself. Sure. Um, so no college degree is needed, no cert certification. Honestly, we recommend training. Um, because everything you that you need to be a broker, you can't Google. Um, but we basically help you um, like summarize everything and put everything together in the correct order and the right steps, right, that you need. So um, you have to have what's called a motor carrier authority. That's through the FMCSA, the Federal Motor Carrier Association. And um, you apply for that the same as you would if you were trying to get a trucking company. You have to have the same motor carrier authorization to broker freight. You then have to have what's called a BOC3, that's a blanket of coverage, and that is literally a process agent in every state that can accept 
a paperwork or like a claim on your behalf. Um, you have to have a surety bond. So it used to be $10,000, now it's $75,000. Um, so you just uh, uh, pay a premium of that $75,000 based on your credit and your experience. Um, what am I missing? Oh, the UCR. So the UCR um, covers like, um, so it's, it's, not, it's not a requirement of the FMCSA like it is for the freight broker um, authority. But what it is, you have to have it in place to cover um, motor activities throughout the state. Um, and it's, I think it's like $62. Um, so you do that once a year. And with all of that, and you have your customer, you could be a freight broker. And Tristan, if I'm missing something, uh, let me know. <laughs> That's it. So you're saying today, if I want to, because from the outside looking in, you would think that it is so deep. And it's so much involved yeah. to get into this business. There are no classes that I need to take. There's nothing online. There's nothing that I have to have in terms of my background, meaning I don't need to have been a driver and really understand the industry. So, so long as I take care or check all of the boxes that you just mentioned, Sam, I can go out and work as a legal freight broker. And that's, and I think, and that's, that's actually a good point because I think a lot of people have a misconception that they have to have a truck, that they have to have their CDL, that they have to have some type of degree. And I'm like, no, like you don't need any of that. You worry about the carriers having their CDL. Um, but that's why we do say when you come to the training, we try to teach you all, you know, the lingo that you need, um, how to build your rates. I mean, just because you're a freight broker, you don't want to get into there. You don't know how to build a rate to a shipper where they're only paying you say, you know, $400 and you should have got a thousand, but you have a carrier now looking for a thousand dollars to move that low, but you didn't get enough out of your shipper. So we try to teach you how to build rates based on those lanes. We teach you how to get shippers. Um, so yeah, I mean, anyone can really become a freight broker. Like you said, you check off those few boxes and you're ready to roll. Got you. Sam, um, excuse me, Tristan, can you speak to me how much insurance do you need to have on hand to become a freight broker? Is, is there a set amount? I know you said you need $75,000 in assurity bonds, but in terms of actual cargo insurance, is, is there a set amount that you have to have in place? So no, there's not a set amount. There's actually no legal requirement for brokers to have insurance. But now shippers, lots and lots more shippers are requiring that brokers have $100,000 in cargo insurance. Um, some are requiring 200000 So every shipper is not going to require you to have insurance. And, you know, not to backtrack, but just what you and Sam were talking about, about becoming a broker, it is absolutely just that easy. But that is not to be a successful broker. Um, we tell people, and we can get into this later if you like, but we tell people you can actually Google how to become a freight broker. You, you can do that, right? Mm -hmm. But Sam and I are two of the people that we Googled how to be a freight broker. We took a class and we realized there's so many moving and missing pieces. So what we teach is how to become a successful broker. We show people the mistakes that we have made because again, it is just that simple. Those same steps that Sam just told you, getting that authority, that BOC3, um, that surety bond and that UCR, yes, you are a broker. You can do that application today and 21 days later, you are a freight broker, Sean. That is absolutely correct. But wow. will you have success? Probably not. Wow. I, I, I think that this is going to be <laughs> incredible news. I mean, even as I'm speaking to you both, I, I'm blown away. I had no idea that it was just that simple. Um, Tristan, I know that you are alluding to some of the mistakes, and I definitely want to go into that. I got a couple of questions before I go um, down that path, because I think that there's so much that you guys can bring to light in that part of the conversation. I asked you earlier about agents working exclusively with brokers. Do the actual ship shippers, the drivers, do they need to work exclusive with agents and brokers or are they pretty much freelancers? 
So I like to say, you know, when it comes to drivers, I mean, carriers, we're for hire, right? So as a broker, there's hundreds and thousands of brokers out there. We get out there and we post our loads to load boards. We also build relationships with carriers outside of the load board. So let's just say you are a carrier, right? And I'm the broker. I may be sending you an email list every day of the different loads that I have. You don't have to move a load for me. If you see one that you like, you can say, hey, I'm going to grab this load. But then I see Sam has a load um, that I'm going to pick up next. Carriers usually are not exclusive to any broker. On the other side of that, when it comes to a shipper, you absolutely want to be an exclusive broker um, to a shipper. But that's, that's not always the case. I mean, just like she mentioned Walmart. They probably work with 500 different brokers because they have so much freight to move all over the United States. Um, Sam and I both have a few customers. Some of them are smaller or mid-sized companies that we are the exclusive broker. But we also have customers that we that they work with multiple brokers, not just us. Got you. Understood. Can you speak to me? What is the best way? And, and I guess I'll ask you this, Sam. What is the best way? I check these boxes. Now I am legally a, a, a freight broker. I'm going, I'm patting myself on the back, off to the races. And then it's like, damn, what next? How do you even build relationships? And I'm trying to get my lingo right. I think I just got it wrong earlier. No, you're how do I build relationships with these shippers? How do I, how do I get contracts? So what we recommend is going in person. We understand that COVID, you know, has changed the way of life. Um, we recommend going in person. I feel like there you can kind of really see, you know, like what vibe are you giving off with one another? We always say go in person if you can. Um, cold calling works, um, sending emails. I mean, there's so many. And Tristan will tell you, like, I see somebody with a, a company jacket on from a shipper and I'll walk up to them, hey, you work there? You know, I mean, you never know. They could be the shipping manager. I was at a Christmas party one time and I met the compliance manager for Kroger's. That's how they became one of my customers. Um, but building relationships, like I said, is, is going to the shipper, introducing yourself, and then just basically letting them know that you're different from any other freight broker, whatever that is. You know, if you have a team, if you have a staff, um, if you work with other shippers before, you can use them as a reference. For us, we can always say that we're carriers first, you know, because we were. I mean, we had our trucking company first. So I'm so every transaction, every load that I move, I put myself in that carrier shoes. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's probably your best way is to be honest, be transparent, and going in person. Okay. Before, when, I, move when you you, can. Tristan, before I move to you, Tristan, um, Sam, you just said it's always better to go in person. Okay, I'm going in person. Who am I talking to? Am I talking to the front desk person? Am I talking, like, who am I even asking for? Who's the decision makers? That's a good question. So um, we tell people, it's usually like your shipping manager, um, logistics manager. We have LinkedIn. We have Google. I mean, the internet is dangerous. You can get in there right away and ask, you know, go straight, straight in. Hey, can I speak to Sean? You know, something like that by first name. Um, sometimes it is a little harder to go in person, but usually if you have a name, like me and Tristan always tells our class, if you get past the gatekeeper, usually, um, or if you work your way to the top, hey, I was supposed to call Sean later today, can I be transferred through? Knowing, knowing that going well, Sean doesn't even know me, but I was able to pull that name and usually that gets you in the door. Um, so like I said, shipping manager, um, logistics manager, just any anyone really in shipping that is over that type of, that over the type of processing of moving the, that commodity. Got you. Tristan, I mean, this is just, you guys said it was so easy to get in. I got to believe that everybody feels that I can go in, in a few weeks from now, I'm an actual licensed freight broker. Is there room in the industry? Is, is there space? Is the industry large enough for all of the different people who, you know, because it's no real requirements to, to get in, I got to believe that it's an oversaturated industry. No? There, there is no room unless you're a fair broker. So any and everybody should not just go out and be a broker. See, the reason why I want people to be brokers is if they have 
um, some sort of compassion for a trucker. You know, like you got to understand what they go through. You have to understand they're away from their family. They're out on the road. They're on long hours. You know, they don't get to see their family for weeks at a time. So my thing is there's room, but there's not room just for anybody. You know, a lot of people want to be brokers because they hear that you can work from home. Mm -hmm. um, you can set your own hours. You can literally get one customer and make six figures. All of that is absolutely true. But the difference in Sam and I, again, we're carriers first. We know I don't have a CDL, but I have driven a truck. I've been over the road with my drivers. I mean, we spend lots of money on insurance and maintenance. So, yes, there's lots and lots of rooms. Why? Because shippers are... You know, businesses start every day, right? So there's lots and lots of companies that have freight to be moved. But we see that there's a lot of people in the industry. They're all only about the money. And if you're going to have that type of attitude, then now this space is definitely not for you. Because we, we truly believe in treating the carrier fairly. And, I mean, in our training course, Sean, we literally called a shipper, okay? And we told this shipper, like, we, we introduced ourselves, we asked for a meeting, even during COVID-19, and we have this on video. We did a whole video shoot with this shipper. He didn't know what we were gonna say. He, he accepted the meeting, and Sam and I went in there and we got that shipper. So we actually show people how to do this, but you know why he agreed to do business with us? We told him that we're available 24 hours of the day, and we are. Rather it's me or her or someone on our team, that customer can always get in touch with us if there's a problem. When my customer calls and says he needs a truck at three o'clock in the morning and it's snowing in Pennsylvania, I still get him a truck. So to answer your question again, yes, there's plenty of room in the industry, but it's not for any and everybody. Even though it's easy to start a brokerage, it's, this is not for any and everybody. Great answer. Talk to me, what are the costs associated with becoming a broker. And do I need, both of you have trucks. I know one of you mentioned you have five trucks. I don't, I, I don't recall what the other one of you mentioned. We both have five. We both no. have five trucks. Okay, no, beautiful. Five. You both have five trucks. If I'm getting in the game, do I need to incur those expenses? Is there a reason that you, obviously I know a little bit about your backstory, so I know you both started off as carriers in, on that part of the game. But what are some of the costs that are associated with becoming a successful broker? So to actually start the brokerage, you can do that for less than $5,000. That, that startup cost is less than five grand. I mean, you're looking at $300 for your authority your surety bond is going to be based on your personal credit. So that's another thing that we teach in our course. Don't go applying for an authority. You know, you need to make sure that your credit is on point, your credit worthy. So that is going to determine the cost of your surety bond. Someone with excellent credit, you can get a surety bond for $1,000. So on top of that, you have your BOC3, which is about 50 bucks, 50 to 100 bucks, depending on who you, who you go with. Um, and then you have, so I said surety bond already, which like I said, someone with great credit, maybe around $1,000, someone with not so good credit, um, about $3,000. And that's for the year. So you do renew that every year. But those initial startup costs, less than five grand. You don't need a truck at all to start a freight brokerage. And you, have, you don't have to have ever owned a truck. Got you. So, Sam, to you, why, why do you own five trucks? Why do you, what, what are the benefits of having your truck? I know you don't have to have, or you don't have to own trucks to be a successful broker. What are the benefits of having these trucks? Well, Sean, I'm going to speak because I think Sam might be taking a truck and call. This happens to us all the time. Okay. So, please forgive us with that. But we No worries. We have trucks on the road right now we get calls it could be a breakdown it could be something serious um but i'll say this so when i first got into trucking like i said that was for my father-in-law to drive right and so we'll talk about the issues later on but we ended up stopping and then we had to start over we did different areas of transportation um, my husband decided that he wanted to leave his job and, and drive trucks. So he drives what we call a hot shot. He, at this time, he no longer drives. But when he started, he was driving a dually 
with a trailer. And that's what we call a hot shot setup. So it was more so because we have a disabled son. You know, I have a 12 year old disabled son and my husband and I knew that we wanted to be able to be the ones to care for our son, like me be at home, um, be his full time caretaker and not have to depend on anybody else. And him driving along with us having other trucks allowed us to do that. Um, I also say that I'm able to be a successful broker because me having those trucks, I understand what they go through. I understand what the carriers go through. I know the expenses. So when I'm out there fighting against a shipper, going back and forth with them for days on the cost of a particular lane, it's because I know what it really takes to move that truck. Like I am the broker that will ask the shipper, when was the last time you drove a truck? I mean, I'm just real straightforward with them. And I've been able to build and keep relationships because some of them have told me like I really haven't met anybody as outspoken as you and and I tell them like I know exactly what it takes so you you gotta pay more money if you want to get this done um so you know when you ask again about the benefits of owning a truck I mean freight is always going to move so why not you know we know the industry that's multiple streams in this one particular industry for us and for anybody else that's brokering or dispatching and they own trucks as well. I mean, freight is always going to move. Even if the economy is bad, if there's a natural disaster, what's the first thing FEMA's looking for is trucks to get those generators to these people that, you know, experience a hurricane or water and things like that. So for us, I just think it's because it's our passion. We've been doing it and um, we actually care about carriers, you know, so you speak again and again about the carriers. Can you give me an idea of what are some of the expenses that go into moving, you know, owning these trucks, moving this freight that you, because ultimately I want to lead to how do you base your price? How do you, you know, for anybody who's watching this, they might be clueless as to, well, you know, I just want to get business. I'm going to go in as low as I can possibly go just to score the business. But listening to you, you're, Avi, you're like, no, that is, it, and I don't want to put words in your mouth. It sounds like that's the wrong way to go in. That's absolutely the wrong way. Um, carriers actually drive the market in the industry. You know, when, when they take those cheap, those very, very cheap loads, they're driving down the market for that particular lane, and it's bad for everybody. So that's absolutely not the way that you want to do it. Um, I do speak so highly of carriers because I have a family full of truck drivers. It's important to me that they're being treated fairly. I mean, I love my father-in-law. So when I saw him constantly being gone, we barely got to see him being over the road, and he was barely making any money. That's, again, what got me into the industry. So I'm very passionate in that aspect. Um, I'd say, and I say this all the time. Sam knows I say this all the time. My best friends are truck drivers. If you want to know trucking, you, you become friends with truck drivers. You talk to them. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you get to know them and what, they, what their struggles are, what they go through. And that, that really helps a lot. You know, um, insurance is very, very expensive and it keeps going up. That's a huge expense in trucking. I mean, a lot of companies start out with brand new units. Those trucks are brand new. I personally, we always buy used equipment. And it's, I, I'm, I'm from a small town. I live in the Charleston area of South Carolina, but we have a mechanic that's literally like five miles from my shop. So anything that goes wrong with the truck, he can fix it. So we buy used equipment, which definitely um, helped us. We don't have a lot of debt at all when it comes to our trucking company. Um, so the, it, again, the insurance is very expenses, expensive. You have maintenance, you have repairs. Um, a lot of truckers, we actually use factoring and, and factoring is, is so we can get our money quickly. Like factoring companies actually buy our invoices when we deliver a load so that we can get paid daily. I, I, I want you to, I want you to stay on that because that was one of my questions coming up. Can you, can, can you go into depth on what a factoring company is? Yes. So in, in layman's terms, like you said, breaking it all the way down, a factoring company buys your invoice. OK, they do that for a percentage. So you're a truck driver. You're out on the road. You're going to have lots of expenses, insurance, fuel. You want to get paid quickly. 
So what a factory company will do is they will buy an invoice from a freight broker, the person that you haul that load for, and that they will pay you right away and they take a percentage of your earnings in order to do that, to basically advance you that money. So um, we, we always laugh and joke and we say we get paid every day. In trucking, you do. I mean, even on the brokering side, if you use factoring, um, we can get paid every single day. Every time a load is delivered and we submit that paperwork to the factoring company, we can get paid. So that's what factoring is. And back in the day when we started in trucking, we it was highly frowned upon. We, we didn't, you know, there's contracts. So even in the course that we teach, we talk about factoring, we talk about companies to stay away from because some of them will lock you in these contracts and you can't get out ever. You know, um, some people will actually build their trucking companies to the point where they don't they no longer need factoring, but they have a hard time getting out of a contract. So um, factoring can be good if you're with the right company, a company that actually cares about the carrier versus just taking advantage. What is the percentage that the factoring companies typically work off? And um, Sam, I'm not sure if you're back, but if you are back, this question is to you. I am. Sorry, I, I work a full time job too. <laughs> no worries, no worries. So, <laughs> I'm done now though. It was like my supervisor was writing me, so I had to respond. Um, so, I mean, honestly, I think the highest I've seen is like 3% for factoring. And I think the lowest I've seen is like 1.5. What did you about to say, Tristan? It's, it's five for sure, because I had some carry. So oh, yeah, five. Yeah, because of the reserve. You're right. Five, five, I'm on the checking side. Yeah. Sorry, on, on I was the, on the trucking I, side, not the broker. Oh, well, I've seen it on the trucking side, but the more units you have, and, and especially if you've been yeah. in the business, you can negotiate that rate with the factoring company. Because again, that, that's your money that they're getting that fee from. So you always want to try and negotiate. I know when we first got in with factoring, I think we were paying like 4%. And another carrier was like, that's way too much. You know, at that time we had one truck. So as we build, we're like, nah, we need to get down to like 1%, 1.5%, something really, really low. Because you're making more money with multiple units. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you can get it down as low as 1%? Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, especially how much money that, like she said, you're bringing in a month. I mean, if you're bringing in a high revenue, they're definitely going to negotiate with you for the 1%. But I think the highest I've seen, like she said, is 5%. Because what they do, they take out a reserve. So they hold so much money until the shipper actually pays them and then they release it. But again, that can all be negotiated, especially, like I said, if you have a consistent customer and consistent invoices. Okay, as brokers. Which a lot of people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that either. A, a lot of people don't know what exactly, I'm sorry. That, that you can negotiate the rate. They think that whatever that, that factoring company is giving you, like that's it, and you can definitely negotiate anything. Understood. As brokers, what is a typical percent that you're working on? Woo. <laughs> <laughs> um, and you can be vague uh, you know give me an industry kidding. standard no, don't kidding. have to say what you're, you're yeah. working correctly just give me an industry standard it's about well, 15% 15% <laughs> is it's like 15% yeah but but I, I really want to make something clear Sean if that's okay please our focus again is to get the carrier what they need for that truck right so if I'm yeah. getting ready to work on a particular lane, I'm calling all my carrier friends. I'm even looking at my own numbers. If I was to send my truck there, what would it take for me to move that load, right? So in my carrier network, I have lots of carriers, some with fleets of 100, 200 trucks. I'm calling those guys and I need to know what it takes for them to move it. But I also need to know what my smaller carriers like myself, what do you need to move it? When I'm going to the shipper, I am going to get the carrier the rate that they need. And then I'm adding my 15 to 20%. So let's just be very clear. If I'm making 20%, that's really my business. If I got that carrier, what they need. I'm perfectly fine with making 5% on a load if I know that I need to make sure this carrier gets what they need to move that load. I, I have actually fired shippers. 
Like, I no longer want to work with you because your rates are way too cheap. I don't even feel comfortable asking a carrier to touch that load for that price if they would not negotiate. So industry standard is 15%. But again, as a broker and as a carrier first, I don't even feel comfortable taking 15% if the truck didn't get what they need. That's just that. Absolutely. Yep. I'm here. Okay, explain to me, and this might be off the beaten trail, but again, this is your world, not mine. Dispatching, what exactly is that? Sam, you want me to answer? Well, Tristan, go ahead, because I'll say, yeah, because you have the dispatching service. Okay, so when you dispatch, you actually represent the carrier. That means you can have your own dispatch service and you can represent multiple carriers. Or let's just say you have power moves trucking, right? And you're like, listen, I got a multiple businesses. I'm a busy guy. I want to invest in trucking and have these five trucks, but I don't have time to dispatch. Then you can hire an independent dispatcher to either work for you. Well, an independent dispatch service, or you can hire a dispatcher specifically for your company. Their job is to keep your trucks running. That means they're going to be on the low boards. They're going to be um, making, building relationships with carriers. They're, I'm sorry, with brokers and shippers to make sure that your particular trucks stay moving. So that's the role of a dispatcher. The broker's job is to really, we, we work directly with the shipper. Our job is to make sure that the shipper's freight gets moved by, by those carriers. So, I mean, I operate in both capacities because we, we have our own trucks, so we dispatch for our own trucks, and then we have a dispatch firm where we dispatch for other trucks as well. Got you. Before I move the interview on, I just want to make, make certain that, that we're, you know, I'm asking the right questions for anybody who is looking in. In terms of being a broker, I am the middleman. I'm working with the shipper. I'm working with the carrier. I'm making sure the freight gets moved. But if something happens to that truck, if it catches a flat tire, if the engine goes out, if any of that, that is not my responsibility. Yes, it's my responsibility because I'm sure the shipper's going to be pissed and they're looking at Sean. But in terms of those costs that are associated with that truck sitting on the side of the road, that does not hit my pocket, correct? Correct. That, that is, is all correct. on the carrier. That is the full carrier's responsibility. Like I said, and that's why I kind of said it before. It's just our responsibility that we're honest with the shipper. So if a delivery is going to be late, you just want to make sure that you're letting your shipper know, hey, you know, the carrier had issues with the truck. It was broke down or whatever the case may have been. But we're doing what we can to, you know, get that freight move. Now, a good broker, which I've done several times, even with my own truck, as far as because I've, I've actually brokered out loads to my own truck. So I kind of got to like double this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if there is a truck and I've been working with the same owner operator and it's all about building the relationship, I don't have a problem helping that truck find, you know, a repair shop or having someone come out to them. Yeah, they're going to pay for that expense. But if they're an owner operator, which means they're just one truck, one man, you know, I'm like, let me see what I can do to help you. So we can try to, you know, hurry up and get that truck fixed so that way you can get that load delivered. Got you. From a shipper standpoint, what are their basic needs? To get their freight moved. Is, is it that simple? <laughs> it is. That is. The basic needs of a shipper. I mean, they want their freight moved and they want it there on time. I mean, you know, yep, someone probably purchase these products from them and we move all types of stuff. So there's a, a deadline. You're talking about food that needs, needs to be stocked on the shelves of grocery stores. Mm -hmm. You're talking about these large construction jobs and projects. Like it, it, a lot of such stuff is time sensitive. Um, it, it's, Things, pe things that people need, the things that we use and consume daily, you know, you don't want to go to the grocery store and find out they're completely out of chicken, right? So we, we rely on these truckers to get it done. And as a broker, we have to understand that as well. Like, we, we need to understand carrier laws. Like, we need to know hours of service because I can't just tell a truck that's already been on the road for, for 10 hours to turn right back around and go pick up another load and he hasn't even done a reset. So... Yeah, for a shipper, they want their stuff moved and they want it done on time. But we don't just get on a load board and post a load. Like we have to understand really what is it going to take to get this load picked up at this time and get it delivered, you know, at that time. 
Okay, that's a great segue into where I want to go. There are a lot of legalities, there are laws that you guys must adhere to, that your drivers must adhere to. Can you speak to me about some of them? You just mentioned about the, the drivers can't be on the road, but for so many hours. How many hours is that? And also, are there any other, I'm sure there are, are, are thousands of laws out there, but are there any other key laws that we should know about that you guys must adhere to before telling a shipper, yes, I can get a freight from Pennsylvania to Los Angeles, California within the next two days? Sam or myself? Um, Sam, let's go with you. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, one of the things uh, of a law of a freight broker, I mean, we always have to make sure that we're working with a authorized carrier. So you just can't call up, you know, any carrier that has a truck. You have to have to, you have to make sure that their authority matches yours. They're going to have a common carrier um, MC authority. We have the um, broker or property authority. They have to have insurance. So um, I think the legal insurance, the minimum is like $750,000. Um, they, like she said before, they have to have the hours of service. So legally, they have to be able to pick up that load and deliver it. So it's up to the broker's job. And that's the thing, like the shippers, they don't really concern themselves as, as much as what we have to concern ourselves with as far as with the carrier. So if a shipper, like Tristan said, if the shipper says, hey, I need something picked up today and delivered tomorrow, um, you know, as a freight broker, yeah, I'm not driving that truck, but I still have to understand that legally that carrier cannot do that. We need to reschedule that appointment. Like she said, it is a lot of time sensitive um, commodity, especially in our trailers. I do a lot of dairy. I do a lot of frozen items. But the way that the delivery should pick up and, and, and deliver it's, 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 um, it's safe. You know what I mean? We, we know that the produce is going to be safe on there. We have, so we have a temper control reefer or carriers constantly, um, check it. Sometimes there's like a tattletale on there that can actually keep track of the temperature. But again, like I said, as a freight broker, you have to be able to tell that shipper, I can't legally send a carrier in one day to cover say a thousand miles. Legally, they can't do that. Um, but, or know, tell them else, um, right and make them pay for that because i've gotten that yes. where they need something there so quickly and they're like give me a truck just tell them do it i'll throw in a couple dollars extra dollars like no yes. that's, we need a team to do that and it's not just going to be a couple extra dollars this is what it's going to cost you if you want that yes. to happen you know and, and it's nothing wrong with a broker emphasizing safety to a customer you know a lot of those customers have never been in a truck they just know they need a truck to come and get their stuff and take it to where it needs to go. So just like Sam was saying before, we check several things. We even check safety scores to make sure we're picking the right carrier to move that, that free. Legally. Sam, legally as a broker, oh, I'm sorry, I was going to say, but legally as a broker, you can't ask a carrier either. I've actually been, um, I've actually had, had been asked to, like, you know, push a load through. They was going to pay me more money. That was from a broker side to my trucking and I was like no I was like legally because if I get pulled into a way station I'm going down not you so it's just like even as a freight broker like I said you have to know how to manage that if you're if your shipper does want something picked up today and delivered tomorrow then like Tristan said then you need to put a team on there you need to have two people in that truck at the same time to, to accomplish that goal before we move on legally how long can a carrier stay on the road before they have to pull over and get sleep Tristan? So you have, you can drive, um, I'm sorry, they need, you have a 14 hour work day, they can drive 11 hours, and then they have to take a reset, uh, they have to take a, a break. So if they don't, don't, I'm sorry, if they don't do that, they're in violation, um, the points are pretty heavy, they can get shut down, um, with your load, DOT does not care. They don't care at all. If that load is on the truck and it needs to get where it needs to be, but that driver is in violation of those hours, they get shut down. And so now you have a problem, which goes right back to checking the safety score, asking the driver, do you have enough hours to get this load moved? Because they may not, you know. I mean, they will sometimes carriers and they will tell you, like, yeah, I can get it done. We we have enough hours, and they really don't have fresh hours. 
So you, you need to be asking those questions when you're booking the load because, again, you're responsible for that shipper to make sure that the, the freight gets moved. They, they want you to get it done, and you're telling them you can get it done. It's not just, again, putting the load on the board and picking a truck. you got to check all the qualifications and make sure that they can actually get it done. Understood. Sam, is, is, is there any – because we know this is a big world. There are all different types of industries. You guys own five trucks a piece. I'm assuming some of these trucks might, may or may not be refrigerated. Are there preferable industries that you like to stay within? Are there any industries that pay a little more? Or are there industries that you just like, no, keep your money. I, you know, find somebody else to haul that freight. So good question. So I have five trucks, but I, all, my, all my trailers are all refrigerated. So um, what, one thing that we got into refrigerated um, trailers was because they act as a dry van too. So the only thing you do, you just don't turn on the motor for it to stay temperature, temperature control. So if I'm on the load board and I'm looking for a load, I kind of have like best the, you know, of both worlds. I can either pick a dry van load, which means that you don't need a temperature. Um, or like I said, I can do temperature control and I can haul produce, meats, whatever. Um, so that's my niche. So all my shippers are all produce, are all, you know, temperature control commodity because I know that. I know about the lumpers. I know about the title tails. I'm just very familiar with that. Um, as far as who pays more, um, one thing that I like about refrigerated, I feel like we're pretty consistent. I tell people, I mean, you're going to eat ice cream in the winter. You're going to eat ice cream in the summer. So I'm always busy. Um, I always have freight. Um, I don't really understand the flatbed. That's why I partnered with Tristan because that's her thing, um, like the tar thing and all that. Um, I have heard that that does pay more because it's more physical work. Um, but like I said, that was just always my niche just to do refrigerated trailers. And then Tristan, you can jump in with the flatbed. Yeah, so we move, we have, we own flatbeds and we move flatbed freight. Um, I actually broke our combination, um, drive in freight. Uh, flatbed freight and tra freight for uh, dump trailers. But um, when it comes to flatbed, that's what we started with. So that's what I was most familiar with. So I did look for that type of freight, which includes like lumber and steel, um, lots of equipment, construction supplies. Lumber pays pretty cheap. But um, like with my particular company, sometimes we take lumber as like a backhaul to, to get home, um, not coming home empty, you know, to get back or to get back to a better load. So um, and I move a lot of stuff on dry vans as well. I don't do any produce, any um, any freight that requires a refrigerated trailer at, at the moment. OK, so back to you, Sam, because this is your thing. Yep. Refrigerated trucks. Are you charging more for, for produce? And I'm just asking this as a consumer because anybody who goes to the supermarket or the grocery store, the prices continuously are going up for food. And they always blame it on the cost of movement. So is that just, yeah. uh, is that the scapegoat or is it, is it for real? So, I mean, the reason that we would charge more is because we actually have to put fuel in the reefer trailer. Fuel goes up, we're requesting more money. Like Tristan said, us carriers, we drive the 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 rate, right? So if I'm if I'm looking for a lane, say from Ohio to Atlanta, Georgia, I'm gonna kind of see like what it would take for my truck to drive down there, not only with fuel, but I actually have an Excel spreadsheet. They call me like um, the spreadsheet queen, but where I know what <laughs> what my rate per mile is to move that truck. So once I'm saying, okay, I need reefer fuel. I have the maintenance, I have the repair um, fund, I have a, a repair fund, a maintenance fund, then I know what my bottom line is. And then more importantly, like I said, if I'm filling up my reefer fuel and fuel is more expensive, yes, I'm going to ask for more money. Um, but besides, I mean, that's the only thing that's really like different as far as like with the cost of like the meat in the store, that really doesn't affect us as far as like with how we are picking up and delivering. It's more of just like probably the fuel is what we're really considering. So, so all that's the G. When, when we go to the store and the, the price of meat is sky high and they're like, yeah, 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 it costs more to bring it in. That, that's just the BS. It sounds like it. A little bit, but it's still trucking is supply and demand. You know, when you can hardly yeah. something, it'll be more expensive. That's just throughout the industry in general. So 
if you can't get chicken, of course, when you go to Publix and they got chicken, it's going to be almost double the price, you know, if there's a shortage of chicken. Exactly. So, so supply, and the, supply and demand definitely drives the industry. Understood. Question, Tristan. And, and actually, this can go to both of you guys, but I want to start with you, Tristan. I would assume that it just comes with the territory that at some point, you're going to lose a load for whatever reason. A truck breaks down. Um, Sam, in your case, you are working with refrigerated trucks. So if, if the refrigeration goes out, you lose a load. Who eats those costs whenever a load is lost? And is that the reason why they're cracking down now on making sure that these carriers have insurance? We'll start with you, Tristan. So, you know, this can go multiple ways. It depends on what actually happened. You know, if it was a fault of the carrier, that's the purpose of them having that insurance that we can file a claim against. If it was a fault of the shipper, then the shipper eats that cost. If you're, you know, me as a carrier, um, if something happens to my particular truck and I have a load on it, I also have to figure out how to get that load back to the shipper or get it delivered. So, I mean, there's so many different factors, you know, if it's, if it's like natural disaster or something, you know, those are some things that will exclude a carrier from having to be um, held responsible for that freight. So it, it really just depends on the situation. And, and that's why I always say as a freight broker, we are problem solvers. We, we have to get in there and figure it out. Like what actually happened? Okay, let, let's let the carrier tell us the story. Give us documentation. Was it an accident? Was it your fault? Like what really happened? So it really depends. It, it totally depends. It could be different from um, each situation. Um, Sam, have you ever lost a load? Woo, I'm so happy you came to me. I actually have a couple examples. So <laughs> I've bought, um, I bought a truckload of root beer. I have bought onions. I have bought tuna. Um, so what happened was, um, and so I think like the latest situation, we had just bought kiwi. So like Tristan said, we're problem solvers. So I think me being able to be in the freight broker role has allowed me to kind of, I think, handle more of the problems on the carrier side first. So we have one issue where our trailer, our, the, the temperature on our trailer just stopped working. So what we did, we actually asked the freight broker if we could take the load back, have them unload it, get our, get our trailer service, and then go back to pick up that load. Because it's like, I didn't want to be responsible keeping that load on and getting that trailer repaired with that on there. So we were able to, um, I guess, be proactive and not have that. We were going to have to buy potatoes if that was the case. But with us getting the potatoes off and, buy, and fixing the trailer, like I said, you know, that saved me from a claim. So what me and my husband does, we try not to have any claims against our insurance. Like Tristan said, insurance is ridiculous. Um, one of my highest quotes this year was $77,000. So if I don't have to put a claim, I'd rather just buy the product. Um, the other product that we had to buy, we bought um, lettuce. So um, how much was it? Yeah, like $10,000 worth of lettuce. So <laughs> I was like, um, and I, can, I don't like lettuce now. I don't like root beer. I don't like tuna. So um, what happened, it was a USDA issue. But again, I mean, it was on our trailer. So, you know, again, we couldn't really prove that the shipper loaded it on there incorrectly. So what we did, we just bought the lettuce. Um, like I said, instead of, of, of filing a claim, but like Tristan said, I mean, but if you can approve that the shipper loaded the product damaged or rotted or whatever like that, and then see what COVID nowadays carriers can't even go on the dock to even look at the commodity. But if you can prove that they loaded it like that, then you can, you're, you're pretty much protected on getting a claim filed file against you. But if there's um, proof that they can say, hey, you know, which is called a tattletale, they can see that my temperature was going up and down and up and down reading funny, then we are, it is put on us. So for my, um, for my insurance, I have to have $100,000 in cargo insurance to even protect that, uh, you know, to, to cover any um, losses on that trailer. Understood. <laughs> Tristan, you, you alluded to this several times in the conversation. And I told you I wanted to come to this place because I wanted to cover some ground um, before we got here. Can you talk to me about some of the biggest mistakes that from the broker side, brokers make, carriers make, 
And what are the common reasons that brokers just fail altogether? Number one, not being educated. Just being honest. I mean, I love to talk to carriers. Like my conversations daily are with carriers because they can explain things to you. They can, I mean, they've dealt with so many different situations um, from going to so many shippers and receivers. Education is key. Like you need to understand the terminology. I, I don't tell people when they say, oh, well, I have absolutely no experience. Should I just um, take your class and be a broker? Like I, I want to ask them, why do you want to be a broker? You know, like, who do you know that's in trucking? What what made you decide to get into this? Because I don't just want everybody to come take our class because it's not for everybody. You know what I'm saying? But on the broker side, I feel like the brokers that make the most mistakes are the ones that's literally just put, worrying about putting loads on the board and worrying about their money. Like, you, you need to understand what you're doing and ask questions. I feel like when you go to a customer and you ask them for their freight, you're telling them that I'm going to do what it takes to get this done, but I'm also going to be responsible. Every All brokers are not responsible. They just want the money. They see that money coming in. You know, I'm moving a lot of loads, but you're not asking questions. I'm not ashamed to ask my customer questions. Can I come to the warehouse and actually see the operation so I understand what goes on? So I understand why you yell at me if I don't have a truck in there on time. Or so I also understand why all of the carriers are asking me for detention when it comes to your facility. Like, you got to know what's going on. Like, be in the know. Um, one of my carriers calls me his daughter. Seriously. Because we built that type of relationship. And it was, we worked together for over a year before I even met him in person. But it was because I asked the questions like I want to know what goes on in the warehouse. Put me on Zoom, FaceTime me. Let me see what's going on. Tell me when I can come visit. I think it's just very important. And, and another thing is that I think brokers make the mistake of they want to get all the customers, more customers than they can even handle. You know, when you start in your book of business, get started and understand what you're doing. Like set yourself up have a procedure in place, like understand the actual operations before you just go, like it's not a competition or a contest. Like Sam can tell you, it's documented. In my first year as a freight agent, I made six figures, but I didn't have a bunch of customers. I made that, majority of that money came from one customer. I think I, at the time I worked with four consistent customers. And I was the person that was on the phone making cold calls. And at one time I had like 30 shippers. But I had to get rid of them. I, I couldn't handle all of that, you know. And so another thing is getting a team. If you can't handle it, you don't necessarily have to get rid of that customer, but make sure you have a solid team so that you can take care of your customer as well as be fair to those carriers. Because if not, so, somebody's definitely missing out. You know, a low won't get deliver on time. You're going to spend a lot of money paying detention. It's like you're missing the important details. We have to be very pay, pay a lot of attention to details of what we do. I mean, I don't know if you've seen a rate confirmation, Sean, but it includes a lot of information. A good broker is going to give you that rate confirmation with a lot of details. Where do I pick up? Where do I deliver? Is there an, appo an appointment time? Is it a first come, first serve appointment? You know, um, it's so many details to it. So we want to pay attention to detail. We want to make sure we're giving the carrier all the information. We're being fair and not just money hungry because, it, you know, this is really a six figure business and it can happen quickly. It, it really can happen quickly. One customer can can take you to six figures for sure. Got you. Great answer. Um, by the way, say I'm a shipper, Sam. We spoke about this earlier about it's sometimes it's good to go in or actually you guys recommended you go in even during COVID. Now we're all doing Zoom, we're doing digital. But if you get in front of me, what does the spiel look like? What, what, what does the conversation look like from your side? So if anybody's watching this and they're now a freight broker, how do you recommend that initial conversation with a shipper go? <laughs> we just dealt with this one. <laughs> um, so like me and Tristan said, we always go in there and you just, you know, you introduce yourself. One thing that we always say, you don't have to let that shipper know that you're new. A lot of freight brokers make that mistake. They're like, oh, I'm new to this industry. I'm a new freight broker. They don't need to know that. 
Um, that's why we say when we, when we, when we host our training, that's why we try to give you that certain terminology. So when you go in and you approach that shipper, it looks like you kind of already had some experience, right? Um, so when you go in, we just literally say, just sell yourself. I mean, you're literally letting this customer know that you're available 24 seven, that you're there to assist with, you know, any problem freight, any freight at all. Um, it, it's more like you don't want to let them know that you can save them money because honestly, that's not what we're there to do, but we're letting them know, like not only there to service you, but we're there to service the customer. I mean, excuse me, the carrier. And I think that even with me and Tristan, I mean, a lot, like, like Tristan said earlier, a lot of freight brokers just get in this just because of the money. It's not really a passion. And it's like, it, sometimes you may move a load and not make anything, you know? And it's like, that's why I'm like, you're in this because you want to be in it. Um, so like I said, just, just really selling yourself to that shipper, letting them know that you're always available, letting them know that, you know, you're going to be that problem solver that you, that you're not going to have to, you know, involve them as much as, you know, as what they're probably involved now. Um, the whole reason of them hiring you is to take over their freight and to get it moved without them having to basically babysit you. Um, we tell people the reason that um, shippers use freight brokers, if they have 100 loads, they don't have time to keep up with 100 trucks, right? 100 trucks to move those, those loads. That's why they use us freight brokers to move those loads for them. So, um, like I said, if you can, we, we always say, don't, um, don't overpromise, right? Yeah, don't, don't, don't overpromise. Don't let them know that you can do something and really you can't. Like I always said before, be honest. And the, 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 the way that you can be honest, like I said, and, and what I always try to tell them, I'm available 24 seven. I have a staff. I really don't have a staff. It's just me. <laughs> I do everything, but they don't know that, right? Um, and then, like I said, it's always good if you do have references. Hey, I worked with this person. I worked with this person. Kind of give them examples of maybe problems though that you have or, um, you know, like I said, or maybe it's like certain situations that you've been in and, and how maybe you resolve them. Good answer. Tristan, is there loyalty in this game? And I, and I asked this just based off of Sam's answer. As a broker, are you always on the hunt for new clients because shippers are always looking for who can provide me the best rate? Or once you lock in, with a shipper, do they typically stay loyal to your company? So, Sean, you have to remember we're dealing with people, right? These shippers, we say shippers, customer, the company, but we're talking about people here. People make the decisions. Sam can tell you, I have a customer. He says he don't care. As long as he's on this earth and he's already told his son, you better let Tristan move these these loads. And that's just what it is. He's very loyal to me. We were, Sam and I were in Miami together and I it was my birthday and we were, I was in the back of the car and her husband was driving and she was in the front seat and my customer called me. He's like, I need a truck right now. Oh, and it's since your birthday. Um, normally he will pay like, I think like $900 for that load. He was like, I give you 14. And then he texted me back. He was like, bump it up some more. It's your birthday. You in Miami. Have a good time. <laughs> just give me a truck and yeah, bumping up the rate, he was like, have a good time, which was his way of giving me a birthday gift, right? But he's very, very, very loyal to me because he knows that I actually put my all into making sure those loads get covered. If there's a problem, I'm not lying and making a story up. I'm like, this is what happened. This driver just got in an accident. Now he's got to go take a drug test. I got to figure out what we're going to do. We need to get this load back to you. You know, whatever the case may be, I'm just upfront and honest with them. Um, I have another customer here locally that was working with a very large brokerage, and I won't call the name, but a very large brokerage. And my driver and I went in there and we got that customer because she wants to actually be able to talk and sit with an actual person versus just someone that's in a whole nother state that she's never, ever going to meet, never, ever going to see. So when Sam says sell yourself, she's exactly right. Go in there and tell them what it is that you can do. I told them, we are only a 40-minute drive for you. from you. If you need to see me in person, I'm coming. If that's in the middle of the night, I'm getting up and I'm coming. If there's a problem, we're going to figure it out together. I'll sit at the table with you and we'll work on these projects together. So you're dealing with people. People want to have people work with them that they can trust, that's going to be honest with them. So there's definitely loyalty in this industry. 
Um, I have a customer right here in Charleston. My husband got that customer for me. My husband went and picked up a load for, you know, for this customer. And he didn't want any other carrier moving his loads except for my trucking company. Well, because of the relationship that I built, there are certain things that my trucking company can't do. There are certain lanes we're not going to run. There are certain areas that we're not going to go. He has allowed me to broker out those loads. But prior to that, after he met my husband and two of my other drivers, he's like, no, I only want to use you guys. You're dependable. And we're talking about some very, very high dollar freight. So it's trust. You got to build a relationship and build the trust. Sam has the same exact situation. They hire her husband. I mean, because of the uh, quality service that their trucking company provided, they were able to literally go in there and take a customer that was working with bigger brokers. So it's all about the relationship. And there's definitely loyalty. I mean, you have some, they don't care. They just want the cheapest price. But those are the ones we're like, we get them to somebody else. Y'all can have them. We don't want to work with those type of shippers anyway. Got you. Oh, can I add to that really quick? Please. Well, it's funny that Tristan said that because when you said loyalty, good point, because there was a freight broker that um, me and my husband, we have, we had first started working with, with our trucking company ever. We would go pick up the same lane from Ohio to Georgia. And it was house glue, you know, when you build new houses. Well, the guy knew my husband's grandfather. And he was like, oh, you're, you know, you're Smitty's grand grandson. He's like, I'm going to show you this paper. Don't say nothing. We got to see what this, he, when he showed us the paper, we got to see what the freight broker was making. And he was like, I hope that he's paying you fairly. And my husband was like, not really. <laughs> and literally he was like, well, if you guys want to come, you know, come through us directly, we can work with you. And that's how we actually got a shipper too. Because of the, you know, he was, he loved my husband because he was like, we was always on time. We were always picking up, always delivering as we were supposed to be. And it didn't help that, you know, they knew my, my husband's grandfather. So, I mean, like you said, it was just like, who would have known like that relationship from all those years would have landed as a shipper and just, you know, just picking up and delivering. So that's how we ended up, like I said, getting that shipper too. Sam, while we're on with you, what are the typical hours of a broker is, you know, I keep hearing both of you guys mention when you go in, you talk into these shippers and hey, I'm available 24 hours a day. Uh, you know, I'm assuming that they're hitting you on a weekend. Like, are there typical hours that you guys work? Because I have to believe you both of you keep mentioning your husbands. I have to believe that you have mm -hmm. families. For anybody mm -hmm. who's trying to get into this industry, is this an all consuming? industry or do you have set hours and yes my phone's gonna ring you know sometime at nine o'clock at night two in the morning but that is you know on occasion it's it's an exception to the rule but typically we're in the office from nine to five so i will say i mean this business is a 24 7 business it really is um you are not technically working those 24 you know 24 hours but you want to be available um, if a truck is driving in the middle of the night and there's an issue, you know, they may call you and let you know. But for the most part, I mean, if you can start, um, depending on how early you get your loads from your shipper, how early you start posting. Um, I know me and Tristan, we try to work the day, the day before. So a lot of my loads, I may already have covered for tomorrow so I can, you know, start a little later. Um, but for the most part, I mean, load boards usually open between like about 7.30 and 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, and then like I tell people, you can really, your day can end as early as you want it to. As long as you get all your loads covered, you can be done at 10 o'clock in the morning or you can be done as, le as, as late as 5 p.m. Um, but I know like some days if I know I have something to do, I'll get up a little earlier, post some loads, and sometimes I can be done by 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, now, like I said, again, that doesn't mean my day necessarily stop because you still want to do your check calls. You still want to have your carrier call you you know, when they get to the shipper or they can text you or email you, depending on what type of communication you have set up. But at the same time, like I said, you always just want to make sure you're available 24 hours a day. Sam, stick it, staying with you for a second. I know you mentioned you have a full-time job on top of this. Is this the perfect career for somebody who might have a full-time job, but they do have flexibility, they're working from home, or, you know, they don't have set hours. Is this something that, you know, Sean Prez, if I wanted to become a broker, this can squeeze into my life? Or, you know, because I like what you just said. You know, if, if, if yep. you take care of all of your business, you can be done by 10 a.m. Maybe mm -hmm. it'll be five. 
is this something that you have found that if there's somebody who, and I hate to use the word side hustles because I, you guys are entrepreneurs. Right. It's a big difference between mm-hmm. somebody who has a side hustle and an entrepreneur. Is this something that I, anybody can look at to make extra income as an entrepreneur, even if they're currently working a full-time job? So that is a great question. I will say my situation may be a little different than most. So I have flex time. I can start anywhere from 6.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. That's why I get up a little earlier and I try to book my loads. And I work from home five days out the week. So with me, I am able to juggle both. Um, and like I said, with my, you know, with my husband, he's able to assist me as well as far as, you know, taking the calls, doing this and doing that. And I try to do a lot of communication via email. Um, one of our students, she actually was a full-time nurse in Brooklyn and she became a freight broker. You know how they do like three days on, four days off and four, like the days that she was off, she would bust butt, she would book all her loads and then she would have like, you know, she would have her phone on her and she was like in between patients. She said she would check her phone and everything was done, um, via email. So I really think it just depends on what your, what your job is. If you work in a call center, it might be a little harder because you probably can't step away as much. Um, if you're a nurse and you know, you have those few days off and you, you know, want to work on your days off, you can probably uh, make it happen. You just want to make sure that you're always available to your customer. Um, and like I said, with, with my situation where I do have flex time where I can start, I just try to start earlier in the day. Um, I try to work on my lunch break and work on my other breaks. And like I said, it doesn't help that I'm at home so I can, you know, uh, uh, juggle both. Good answer. I, I, my, my last question is to, to you, Tristan. I know you guys both teach and you educate people who are trying to get into this field. Can you give me some key questions that people who want to get into this industry should be asking people like you who are broker trainers before they invest in your program? Sure. So... They should ask, what should I do first? Like, what's some of the beginning steps? And so do you want me to give you the answers as well? No, I just want key questions. And, and, and I guess I'm asking because, for instance, right? And I don't want I don't, I don't to put words in your mouth. But should they be asking, how experienced are you? You know, what, what makes Tristan and Sam – even qualified to be trainers. Like if if I'm going and I'm going to invest in somebody's program, what should I be like before I even give you a dime, what are the questions I should be picking your brain about to make me feel comfortable that you have the answers to the questions I would need to know, even if I don't know the questions yet. Gotcha. Actually the question that you just asked is the question. If you're going to take training, that's exactly what you want to know. What what experience does your trainer have? Are they actually brokering freight? Because that's the thing. Someone may actually have um, a, a training program and they have never or they're not currently broker, brokering freight. You know, um, again, I mentioned before, I started out as a freight agent. So I can, I can tell someone what that looks like to transition from an agent to a broker. That is a, that, that's the key question. If you're going to take a training class, find out why, what makes you qualified to train me? You know, you've heard both of our answers. We've both been in the industry. I've been in since 2009, you know, o- over 10 years. We both have trucks of our own. We know what it actually takes to move a truck. We have major relationships with carriers. Um, we, we have connections with other people throughout the industry. That's not just carriers. We, we can provide resources to you. Um, you know, you can vet us. We have trucking companies. We have brokerages. Uh, we've made the mistakes. That's the biggest thing. We're not going to just teach you the steps A through Z on how to set up the brokerage, but we want to tell you what things you need to watch out for. We want to show you how we literally start out with talking to a customer on the phone, asking for an appointment, going to see them in person. Like, how do you really land that contract? How do you build a relationship with a carrier that can consistently move this freight for you? Like, those are the things that someone that, that's teaching a class should be able to show and prove. I mean, even if they wanted to see some documentation, you know, 
we, we, we have nothing to hide when it comes to brokering because we both, like I personally had to start over from some of the, the things that have, have happened um, with brokering. So those are the things that we can share for, with, with any potential students. When, when we get in class, we actually pull up our, our back offices. We pull things up and let them see. We, we discuss the claims. We discuss the mistakes, discuss the mistakes with them. So um, those are just some of the things you want to look out for. You don't want to just take a class and you have no background knowledge of the person. I mean, see if there's other people in the industry that know them, right? If, if I want to take a class for real estate, I'm, I'm checking around with other people in the real estate industry. Can, can you tell me anything about this person? You know, are they really um, a real estate investor? Are they really a, I won't say guru, because you don't necessarily have to be a guru, but can they really teach me how to start and run a successful brokerage and help me with mistakes? Um, we have testimonies from students. Our students call us all the time. I'm so nervous. I did everything you said. I finally got a shipper. Um, I need to give them a rate. This is what I think. Can you tell me what you think? And then we ask them those questions. Have you talked to any carriers? You know, did, did you calculate really what it will cost um, a truck to move that load? So it, it's a lot that goes into it. It, it really is a lot. We, we spent a lot of time building our program. And our program also includes an actual carrier that's been on the road for a long time that can talk about equipment. Um, that, that, that can tell you about the ELD. You know, we, we include a lot in our training because it's not just go get the authority and start moving freight. It's just, it, it sounds good, but it's just not that simple. Where can people find you guys at? And I'll start with you, Sam. If I wanted to take one of your courses, if I wanted to reach out with you guys, I mean, reach out to you guys to do business, where can I find you at? Sure. So I'm on Instagram, logistics underscore check. Um, we also have a website, logistics with an X first.com. Um, right now, our portal is still being, um, it's, still in, it's still in progress. Uh, we actually went back to go re-record some things um, just to, to perfect it. And just, I mean, we felt like it was so much things missing after we reviewed it. So we're just trying to make sure that we um, left no stone unturned. Um, but yeah, Insta Instagram and um and that website. Tristan. Yeah, so I can be found on Instagram at Lady Logistics, and that's logistics with an X. So L A D Y L O G I S T I X. I'm also on Facebook. Um, we also have a joint page, and it's called Leading Ladies of Logistics, and logistics is also spelled with an X. Um, in addition to our training, Sean, we provide a group on Facebook that's totally for women. It's just a place for women in the transportation industry to connect. And it doesn't matter if you're a dispatcher, a freight broker, a fleet owner, an actual driver, or admin support for the trucking industry. Um, right now, we just started the group about two weeks ago. We have over 200 women that have joined us. Um, some really amazing women that's really doing big things in the industry. So we want to keep growing that. It's a free group. There's no charge. Um, and that group, again, is called Leading Ladies of Logistics. We can be found on um, Instagram and Facebook. Um, Sam and I are the founders of that group. And again, we just wanted to put together um, a place for women in the industry because like you said at the beginning of the interview, this is a male-dominated industry and we want to stick together. We do teach men in our program. Our training program in the Freight Broker Portal is geared for anybody that wants to be a broker or an agent, but the mentoring group is specifically for women only. And I was just about to ask you that. It, 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 is your training for everyone or is it just for, for everyone? And a part of the portal, we also will have ongoing support. So there will be a group for anyone that's, you know, taking the course, that's being a part of the portal. Um, we will offer monthly mastermind sessions where they actually get to connect with us and ask questions and give us feedback on how things are going for them with their business. Sam, Tristan. I want to thank you guys so much for your insight, for your experience, and your willingness to share um, so many details in this conversation. I've learned so much, and God willing, I asked the right questions. So if anybody's interested in this line of work, they can at least have a beginner's roadmap to getting on the right track. Thank you so much, guys. 
You both are true power move makers, and I look forward to connecting with you both in the future. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for having us, Sean. We really do appreciate it. What's up, guys? Thanks for sticking with me to the end of the video. Truly appreciate you. If you like anything you heard here today, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And if you know anybody that can benefit from this message, feel free to share. Peace and love.